Jacobo Grinberg Zilberbaum, 1987. Self-Reflexive Meditation About my own updating these days, it is truly creative and destructive. I play with miraculous transformations, penetrating all circumstances, and wherever I am, I have nothing more to seek. Circumstances are no longer capable of changing me. If students come to find me, I go out to see them. They do not see me. Thus, I dress in all kinds of garments. The students immediately begin to speculate about them, taking them as my words. All this is very sad. Blind and bald men without eyes depend on the garments I wear, green, yellow, red, or white. When I take them off and only put on the garment of purity, the students see a reflection and gather among themselves with joy. And when I undress, they become disillusioned and with surprise, they run scared and complain about my nakedness. So I tell them, do you truly know me, who dresses in all these garments? And suddenly they turn their faces and recognize me. Rinzai Jaijin Introduction Throughout its evolution, humanity has always sought new forms of development and growth that allow for a fuller, happier, and healthier life. In this regard, in recent years, some meditation techniques have begun to be disseminated, creating a growing movement of interest directed towards self-awareness and expanding consciousness. Unfortunately, most of these techniques are offered without a deep understanding of their psychophysiological foundations and are surrounded by superficial paraphernalia linked to the need to belong to this or that school and depend on this or that teacher. The most unpleasant aspect of this movement is that some schools seem to mix economic interests and sectarianism, which distorts the true sense of consciousness development, which, to be effective, must be free from mysteries, subterfuges, and selfish interests, focusing instead on achieving unity through the expansion of consciousness. Originating based on studies of shamanism, the meditation technique presented here has undergone years of research, testing its basic postulates, its psychophysiological correlates, and its goodness for stimulating a healthy and natural development of brain physiology and consciousness. For this reason, its practice poses no risk, does not require belonging to any sect or lineage, and its teaching is open and without economic interests. In this book, self-reflexive meditation is explained first in its theoretical basis and then in the practical procedures to activate it. Self-reflexive meditation is a natural technique based on normal developmental processes and devised to stimulate the latter in a conscious, active manner and in perfect agreement with reality as it is. Many efforts have contributed to the development of this technique, particularly those of the National Institute for the Study of Consciousness, INPEC. It was precisely at the regional center of the state of Puebla, of the INPEC, where several explanatory seminars on self-reflexive meditation were held, resulting in the motivation to write this book. Conacyt collaborated by financing research on Mexican autonomic psychology, which served as the basis for this work. It is my greatest wish that this book helps to promote self-awareness and consciousness. Jacobo Grinberg Tepetzintla, Puebla, Spring of 1987 Part 1 Theory I Levels of Algorithmicization it would seem that the human brain possesses a mechanism of self-correction and integration. During development, increasing amounts of information are integrated into coherent and unified systems. Humans do not tolerate mental discomfort or confusion. They prefer order, inner peace, and states of equilibrium. Since there is growth and informational and environmental complexity conditions constantly increase, cerebral states of equilibrium, to remain effective, must undergo periodic review to integrate novel and precedent information into new and more expanded homeostatic states. An algorithm is a formula, pattern, or code that incorporates information into its structure. 
Mental homeostatic states are algorithmic states. These equilibrium states are sustained by the achievement and activation of brain algorithms. For a brain to activate an algorithmic pattern, it must have the appropriate anatomical structure and coding mechanisms to unify and integrate a large amount of data into a pattern that includes them. This inclusion is called self-reflexive when the pattern manages to incorporate all the cerebral information of the present. There are many levels of inclusion so that one could think of the existence of a pyramid of consciousness in which each of its strata incorporates information from previous levels. The level of greatest pyramidal inclusion, which incorporates all the information of the system at a given moment, is the level of self-reflection. Self-reflection allows one to contemplate the common characteristic of a system. This common characteristic has been called by different names, the essence of the system, its spirit, or basic character. The more information is concentrated and integrated at the self-reflexive algorithmic level, the more stable it is. Such stability means that the algorithmic pattern retains its structure, regardless of modifications to the information it feeds on. There exists a limit of self-reflexive stability, that is, when the informational elements nourishing an algorithm exceed a certain threshold of variation, the algorithm may not be able to maintain its structure and changes. This modification disrupts the equilibrium of self-reflection. This work argues that there is a directional axis of development, which acts as an attractive determinant of the system, leading it towards states of greater unification. When the self-reflexive equilibrium is disturbed, the system must create a new pyramidal step and a novel level that will also be subjected to self-reflection when the system decants the inclusive algorithm capable of integrating all previous information, including that of the new level. Growth consists precisely in the search for new levels of integration and in the achievement of more powerful algorithms and states of self-reflection of greater unification. The axis of development has a unitive directionality. Each new algorithmic level incorporates more information and, therefore, brings the entire system closer to unity. Living systems that have evolved have done so guided by this directional axis of unification. The appearance of the atom as an integrated set of particles, of the molecule as an integrated set of atoms, of the cell, the tissues, and the whole organism is an example of the above. Nature's experimentation to create organic forms of increasing complexity and unification accelerated with the appearance of brain systems, which unify information and create algorithmic sets at a speed millions of times greater than necessary for these sets to acquire a fixed organic sustenance. Neuronal software precedes bodily hardware, although both travel on the same path. It is not possible to achieve a satisfactory state of self-reflection unless the novel level of integration, the result of the last self-reflexive imbalance, has been completed. That is, it is not possible to find the algorithm of a system unless it has experienced all the contingencies of its new state. This is why leaps in growth cannot be made. Drugs, for example, which in the psychedelic era activated leaps in algorithmic development, failed because without them, brain systems returned to previous levels of development. The motivational syndrome in the chronic drug addict arises as a consequence of the inability to sustain, in daily life, the levels of experience provoked by drugs. On the other hand, if there were a technique that stimulated natural development, promoting unification, algorithmic creation, and self-reflection, this technique could satisfy the legitimate human desire to engage in a significant growth process tending towards achieving contact with reality. This technique exists, and it is self-reflexive meditation. 2. Approach to Reality Unification during algorithmic development has its model in at least two brain processes, the creation of inclusive neural patterns and the development of neural fields of increased synergy. Both processes are complementary, correlated with each other, and guided by the same developmental axis. 
The creation of high inclusion neural patterns sustains language, conceptualization, and abstraction. The creation of fields of increased neural synergy is the foundation of the experience of unification. According to synergistic theory, the brain creates a field of interactions capable of modifying the structure of the space-time matrix. This alteration unifies brain activity with the rest of creation at different levels, depending on the informational density of the neural field, its coherence, and frequency, that is, its synergy. The greater the synergy of the field, the greater the unification. In turn, the synergy of the neural field depends on the algorithmic power of the neural patterns of inclusion that the brain has managed to activate. There are different levels of consciousness, each of which depends on the synergistic level of the neural field and the algorithmic power of the neural pattern of inclusion. At each of these levels, real experiences are activated, but the reality from which they arise is that of total unity. The experience of unity is the experience of reality. This reality sustains all levels of consciousness and underpins the existence of any experience. An approach to reality is achieved as greater amounts of information are unified. This does not mean that the process is intellectual or theoretical. Rather, informational unification, to provoke an approach to reality, must be authentically experienced as an expansion of consciousness, in which identification with increasingly global aspects is strengthened and accentuated. We are accustomed to identifying our personal identity with levels of reality that are not reality. We believe we are a body or a mind. We believe we are an idea or a theory. We believe we are our emotions. We believe we are a country or a flag. Identification with our body is the deepest and most widespread identity. Along with it, we identify with our money, property, and possessions. Some believe we are our brain and think we would disappear if it were destroyed. In reality, we are reality itself and not one of its parts or portions. This reality is what gives life to our consciousness, regardless of its contents. This reality is, at the same time, the basis of any of our experiences. One of the Eastern systems that comes closest to the study and practical activation of the experience of reality is Mahamudra. This Buddhist technique affirms that all contents of realities are reflected by the mirror of the mind, which is totally pure. The Mahamudra technique consists of experiencing that mirror independently of the content of its reflections. This implies not identifying with the content of experience, but with its origin, and this is closer to reality. In other words, the meditator of the Mahamudra technique learns to focus attention on the common substrate of all experience, on its origin itself, regardless of its quality and content. This origin has its model in the high coherence structure of the lattice of space. In fact, according to the synergistic theory, since experience appears in the interaction of this matrix with the neural field, the substrate of any experience and its origin itself is the pure and unaltered state of the lattice prior to any interactive modification. This pure substrate is what the meditator attends to during Mahamudra. However, this does not mean that what Buddhism calls the mirror of the mind is this lattice, also known as the quantum field. The latter is a physical model of something that, like consciousness, cannot be reduced to the material world. At the same time, it is necessary to remember that what we call the material world and what we know as solid objects arises and represents a limited decoding of one of many realities. Solidity and separability are more a result of brain processing than a reality in itself. Even physics has demonstrated the dual particle wave nature of any object. The limits and boundaries that seem to separate one object from another are relative to the perceptual threshold. 
for a finely tuned perception that would penetrate, perceptually speaking, to the atomic level, the absolute substantiality, solidity, and separability of objects would disappear, giving way to the image of a whole intertwined with, indeed, portions of greater and lesser density, complexity, coherence, and order of a common energetic organization. Such would be the perception for an eye and a brain operating in a duration of the present shorter than usual. Returning to the Mahamudra technique, it is necessary to consider that the approach of its meditators to reality is not total, since even the experience of living any experience from its substrate can be observed. I will speak about this limitation later. Also in Buddhism, the non-existence of objectual substantiality is recognized. In other words, the Buddhist affirms that no object, process, organism, or experience possesses absolute reality. Rather, everything is dependent and intertwined within a network of relationships. Thus, the identification of a human being with something that possesses nothing more than relative reality would condemn them to that same relativity. Now, if there were nothing capable of transcending the relative, the human condition and its consciousness would be condemned to live subjected to the random fluctuations of relative events in a world also relative, lacking in meaning, direction, and source. Self-reflexive meditation considers that even that world could be observed, so the observer must belong to a reality that transcends the relative, that is, belongs to reality. 3. The Self-Reflexive Experience The self-reflexive experience, that is, the observation of one's total self in the present moment, is not a passive experience, especially when the self-reflection is limitless. In other words, when the result of self-reflection is subjected to observation again and so on in a constant and continuous process. Limitless self-reflection can be continued until the algorithmic capacity of the system is surpassed. At that moment, the system must acquire new information and integrate it until it decants a novel algorithm that can be subjected to self-reflection. The self-reflexive experience is an experience of unification that receives, therefore, the same vitalizing energy that has guided the evolutionary process. Therefore, this experience, more than passive, is ecstatic and, more than equanimous, is of grace. From a psychophysiological point of view, the self-reflexive experience is explained in the same way as any sensory experience, that is, as a result of an interaction between the neuronal field and the quantum field. But since self-reflection increases the informational density, coherence, and synergy of the neuronal field, it is capable of establishing a congruent interaction with a level of the lattice very close to the very origin of the quantum field. Therefore, the resulting experience is what Buddhism calls nirvana, what Sufism calls bhaka, and what could be expressed as pure consciousness or pure self. On the other hand, although the experience of the egoic presence can arise in any area of field interaction, there are preferably three main locations for its appearance. These are, inside the neuronal field, in the very zone or border of field interaction, and in the quantum field. Intraneuronal activation is a bodily location, activation at the border of interaction is a location of the egoic experience and the experience itself, while quantum activation is an extracorporeal location. Since I have already analyzed in detail some aspects of these three locations, here I will only mention that the quantum position results in the activation of the double and a capacity to modify physical aspects of reality. Returning to limitless self-reflection, I mentioned earlier that this can be continued until the point at which the system cannot find its own algorithm. Generally, at that moment, the location of the egoic experience varies from an extracorporeal position to another at the border of interaction, and the subject ceases to be an observer of their experience to identify with it. When this identification occurs in areas of high synergy, the resulting experience is one of ecstasy and spiritual joy. When an algorithm is successfully established, and therefore, the previous state is self-reflected, 
the system completes a new level of development and begins its development process towards greater unification again. Therefore, self-reflexive meditation is a highly active, alive, and vital technique. Self-reflexive meditation increases consciousness, strengthens action, and does not require confinement, silence, or even isolation to progress. It is a completely natural procedure that allows one to be in the world, although not of the world. That is, for the self-reflexive meditator, there is no longer identification with the world, but their experience persists in it. It does not deny the existence of the world, it transcends it, locating itself closer to the observer and reality than to any reality. The capacity for self-reflection admits no limits or goals, however, to progress, it requires willpower and personal power, and the latter, to exist, does not admit useless distractions or fleeting pleasures. In this sense, self-reflexive meditation is similar to Zen, which discards the idea of the existence of a final goal, considering it childish and illusory. Reality is always present for those who are capable of perceiving it. The preparation to perceive it can lead to the goal of establishing contact with it, but this goal does not imply that reality exists in some future that is yet to come and does not exist now and here. Reality is always present, and it is our choice to either be in it or to identify with some specific aspect of it. This latter identification, being temporal and finite, has as its destiny death. In contrast, the observer and reality survive. One of the Buddhist techniques most similar to self-reflexive meditation, Vipassana, teaches its practitioners the art of observation, even leading the most talented to the possibility of observing the process of their own bodily death, presumably surviving it. Self-reflection is not an analytical observation and should not be confused with what could be termed superegoic observation, in which the internalized cultural portion of personality judges one's own behavior, judgments, and thoughts from a platform of critical analysis. Self-reflection is direct and does not require mental or cultural intermediaries. Furthermore, these intermediaries are part of the observation contents that will ultimately be self-reflected when they are integrated into an inclusive algorithm. Therefore, the observer is not the Freudian superego, nor is it a zone or level of the mind, as mistakenly held by Buddhism. The observer is the guide of the process and, like reality, is always present witnessing the contents of the mind. 4 the shared mind. The mind is shared and not private. The thoughts and state of consciousness of one subject are directly communicated to other subjects. The mind, in reality, is part of the same field interaction from which sensory experience arises. Therefore, the content of the mind is inscribed in the same lattice of the quantum field of which all neuronal fields are part. When self-reflection occurs, inevitably, contents belonging to other minds with which relationships are maintained are observed. At a certain level of self-reflection, the personal ego dissolves, and the only thing that persists is the act of observation, transcending conditioned personality. It is not a disappearance of individuality, but rather its expansion. In more advanced stages of self-reflection, closeness to unity begins to become evident. The act of observation incorporates the same hyperfield nourished by the neuronal fields of an increasing number of beings. In reality, the shared mind is the same mind from which the individual arises. Its basic substance, the quantum field, does not admit owners, and thus, any path whose direction brings it closer to unity must confront the existence of it. At that juncture, there are at least two possibilities for choice, on one hand, the acceptance of one's own identity as capable of including the whole, or the rejection of the other, considering it essentially alien to the self. In the former case, the path leads to the disappearance of the ego and to unity, in the latter, separation and isolation are activated. In self-reflexive meditation, it is essential to learn to accept. 
Any content of one's own mind, regardless of its origin, is part of consciousness, and this, in turn, is part of unity which one aims to live. Therefore, self-reflection without acceptance is impossible. From another perspective, algorithmization only proceeds when information is accepted. If certain contents are rejected, those considered alien and coming from other minds, and others are accepted, those felt as one's own, the algorithm that is decanted will be, at best, partial and incomplete, and self-reflection of the totality cannot prosper. However, acceptance does not imply identification or conformity. Acceptance is for transcending and transforming, not for limiting and identifying. The goal of self-reflection is to reach one's own being, which includes everything but does not identify with anything, which can observe everything but cannot be encompassed by any mental, analytical, or intellectual scheme. On one occasion, Sri Aurobindo said that reality was like a clear sky free of obstacles, through which thoughts pass like birds. These travel from one end of the sky to the other, without leaving a trace, without altering the balance of empty space, without dirtying the atmosphere. Self-reflection requires acceptance to allow the contents to flow without blockages, without creating tensions, so that identification with any of them does not prosper, to keep the reality of the sky clean. Self-reflection is only a technique that allows an approach to reality, it is never an end in itself. The goal of self-reflexive meditation is reality, but it cannot be described or explained. When the contents of any experience are accepted while maintaining the attitude of observation and self-reflection without limits, contact with reality is established. 5. Reality There is no body or mind to self-reflect. There are no thoughts disturbing the state of pure, limitless existence. Everything is part of the same, there are no sections or levels, only peace and existence. Everything vibrates and is vital, everything produces love and belongs to the same being, and it is I and I am it. Constantly, creation happens, but there is no separation between creator and creation, and everything is one. The arrival at reality is unmistakable, there are no doubts or analytical considerations, no questioning, one simply is there, although it cannot be located anywhere. In reality, everything is unified, but the existence experienced cannot be reduced to unity, it is beyond it, and at the same time, it is within it. It exists, simply exists. Furthermore, it is entirely natural and, simultaneously, utterly astonishing. There is no unconsciousness, matter, objects, or separate individuals in it. All are the same being, and this being is one, but it is not amorphous. It exists in total balance and love, in peace and beyond thought. It is reality. Part 2. Practice. 6. Attention Strengthening, Anapana The practice of self-reflexive meditation is based on observation, and for it to be effective, it requires the strengthening of attention. Considering attention as the fundamental tool, this chapter is dedicated to its management and strengthening. Any object or activity can be used to strengthen attention, but among all, the body itself and the respiratory movements are the most suitable. The attention to the latter is called anapana in Buddhism. In all attention exercises, the natural limits of the system must be respected. It is suggested to use cycles of approximately 20 minutes, gradually increasing the duration of the exercise. In a quiet place, free from insects and well-ventilated, it is advised to sit comfortably, preferably wearing loose clothing and with a semi-empty stomach. Once seated, close the eyes and focus on the entry and exit of air from the lungs, without forcing it and trying to keep the respiratory rhythm natural and calm. 
For a few minutes, the practitioner will attend to their breathing, trying to feel, with increasing detail, the passage of air inside the nose, the filling and emptying of the lungs, associated changes in temperature, accompanying bodily sensations, the position of their back, etc. The goal of this first exercise is to maintain attention without deviations and without missing any detail of the respiratory process for 20 minutes. Achieving this requires practicing several times a day, increasing the duration of the exercise each time. When this has been achieved, it is advisable to extend the periods and practice the exercise with eyes open and amidst daily activities. In other words, the goal is for attention to be maintained throughout daily life and not only during special periods. Other attention exercises during daily life include sustained observation of one's own body. The practitioner is recommended to maintain attention on their body, observing and feeling the different postures it adopts in different circumstances while walking, sitting, standing, and lying down. The longer the duration of the period during which the practitioner is able to pay attention to their own body, the more easily they will activate self-reflexive meditation. Another recommended attention exercise is the perception of the shape, colors, and texture details of objects without judging or analyzing their meaning, importance, utility, or designation. This exercise strengthens the ability to attend directly and without intellectual mediations. In addition to the above, this exercise allows for a fresh and vital access to perceptual reality. The practitioner should use these exercises daily and for as long as possible. Ideally, attention should be sustained without interruptions or deviations throughout the day, alternating between focusing on breathing, bodily postures, and objects. 7. Body Observation, Vipassana This is a Buddhist technique currently practiced in countries such as India, Sri Lanka, etc. One of the variants practiced in Burma, according to an old tradition revived by Satya Narayan Goenka, is presented in this chapter. When the practitioner has successfully strengthened their attention, as instructed in the previous chapter, to the point of being able to maintain it focused for a minimum of 20 minutes without distractions or deviations, they can practice vipassana. In this technique, the practitioner learns to feel their body, first part by part and later as a whole, experiencing it as a unity. It is recommended that the Vipassana practitioner exercise this technique in the same clean, ventilated place, free from insects, where they practice their anapana as a continuation of it. In other words, the practitioner will sit comfortably, close their eyes, and begin to concentrate their attention on their respiratory movements until they can maintain it fixed and without deviations. This is the preparation for vipassana. Once this is achieved, in the same posture and situation, the practitioner directs their attention to the top of their head, vertex, and keeps it there until they feel some sensation in that area. The sensation can be tactile, vibratory, tingling, temperature-related, or of any other type. Once this is achieved, the practitioner attends to the sensations around the vertex, moving across the entire upper part of the head. Using the same technique, they move across the forehead, the back of the head, the ears, the cheeks, the eyes, the nose, the mouth, and the neck until the entire head has been covered without leaving any area untouched. Regardless of the quality of the sensation, what matters is not to leave blind spots. When one is found, attention must be focused on it until some sensation arises, whatever it may be. According to Goenka, sensations of pain should be observed with the same equanimity and detachment as those of pleasure. Once the head has been fully observed, the same technique is practiced with the shoulders, arms, hands, back, chest, abdomen, hips, buttocks, genitals, thighs, legs, feet, and toes until the entire body has been covered. The journey is repeated over and over, activating blind spots and observing all sensations that arise with detachment and equanimity. 
Gradually, one tries to feel the bodily unity until the body is observed and felt as a complete unity. One way to achieve this is to unify already covered parts. For example, after observing all parts of the head, it is observed as a unit without simultaneously losing sight of all its parts. The same is done with the entire back after covering all its parts. The unity of the head and back is merged, perceiving them as complete and simultaneous in a new act of observation. Gradually, all parts are unified without losing detail of each one until unified and simultaneous observation of each and every one of them is achieved. In reality, what we are doing is activating and decanting algorithms that become increasingly inclusive until the algorithm for unifying the entire body image is activated and observed. The observation of bodily unity should be maintainable in everyday life. In addition to this surface body vipassana, it is also necessary to observe the internal organs. For this, after covering the entire body surface, attention is focused on the interior, starting with the head region. A practical procedure to achieve this is to place attention on a circle perpendicular to the body's axis. The entire surface of the circle is covered, starting at the highest point of the skull and gradually penetrating through the brain, maintaining observation of its entire surface. The circle is gradually lowered, moving across the entire body. Another procedure is to penetrate a few millimeters at a time in each observation area of the surface during each journey through it. Attention is paid to sensations located more deeply during each journey until the entire interior of the body can be traversed. The algorithm for bodily unification, to be complete, must include both the surface and the interior of the body. Vipassana, in addition to preparing the aspirant for self-reflexive meditation, has an immediate effect of deep body cleansing, healing discomforts, pains, and illnesses, and preventing them. Above all, it strengthens the capacity for observation, attention, and consciousness by awakening the dormant sensations of blind spots. Buddhism considers these blind spots as ignorance, so their revival means eliminating this ignorance, thus expanding consciousness. With this preparation, we are ready to take the next step, the observation of the mind. 8. Mind Observation The mind does not exist as a concrete and independent entity or as a delimited object separated from other objects. When we talk about the mind, we are not referring to the existence of a material mass possessing sensible attributes such as color, shape, texture, or location in space. Rather, we are referring to a dynamic process manifested in the form of thoughts, memories, and images. Therefore, observing the mind is the observation of its contents. In the context of self-reflexive meditation, observing the contents of the mind is done until the experiencer is capable of observing the origin, maintenance, and disappearance of any thought, memory, or image without identifying with them, that is, until the experiencer becomes the observer of the mind. The best way to achieve this is to adopt the same meditation posture as an anapana and vipassana but focusing on the observer. When detached observation of spontaneous mental contents is achieved, the next step is to voluntarily activate a thought or image while observing its origin, maintenance, and disappearance without identifying with them, just as if they were external objects. The detailed procedure to achieve all of the above will be described in the following sections. Observation of Spontaneous Thoughts Sit comfortably with a straight back and perform anapana and then vipassana until achieving the observation of bodily unity using the same procedure described earlier in this book. Once this is achieved, direct attention to any thought that arises spontaneously. The content of the thought can vary infinitely. It could be about the meaning of what one is doing, achievements obtained, a memory, a plan, or a novel idea, etc. In any case, let the thought flow without value judgments or blocks. 
If a judgment arises, observe it without repressing it. Simply allow the mind to choose any course it desires to observe the developments and derivations without identifying with them. If no spontaneous thought arises, then perform a survey of sensations in different body areas, attending to any thought that might appear when one or more points on the surface or inside the body are activated. As the surveys are repeated while attending to thought content, the emergence of thoughts can be observed more clearly and in more detail. The same will happen with their maintenance, development, and disappearance. Regardless of how interesting, valuable, or significant a thought may seem, observe it as such without identifying with it, regardless of its content. Observation of Provoked Thoughts Once the above is achieved and with a calm mind, evoke a thought. In the same way as before, observe it by attending to its appearance, development, and disappearance, observing it as a thought without identifying with its content. Continue the process until being able to voluntarily evoke any thought and observe it as if it were an external object. The key to the process is to transfer the identification of the experiencer with the contents of the experience to identification with the observer, which remains equanimous and true to its own nature regardless of the contents of the experience. Observation of Memories Every point and zone of the body contains memories. Vipassana attention causes these memories to be evoked. The observer exists independently of the contents of its observation. Detached observation of spontaneous or provoked thoughts and memories activates the unification of all mental contents into the unity of the observer. The described procedure will allow the experiencer to better understand their personal history and the origin of their conditioning. Until this real knowledge is achieved, the experience of reality will oscillate between identification with the contents of the mind and localization in the observer as such. The process of traversing the contents of the mind and the emergence of memories has several stages in which a master scheme or pattern will appear with increasing clarity as the subtext of the entire personal history. When this scheme appears, it must also be observed without identifying with it. This will allow achieving a kind of leap in which the meditator approaches their true nature as reality and the observer, not as the subject of experience, although in reality both are the same. Observation of Thoughts Simultaneously The spontaneous or provoked appearance of thoughts may or may not be linear. Several thoughts can even appear together in sequence or in the absence of it. In all cases, these are thoughts that must be observed as such without identifications with their contents. It may happen that a thought about the nature of the mind appears simultaneously with a judgment about some event in personal history. The meditator must be able to observe any thought content independently of its greatness or vileness as mere thoughts without identifying with them. Even the thought of not identifying with them must be observed as a thought. The mind has been conceptualized as a lake and thoughts as its waves. The position of the observer allows observing the lake and its waves from a perspective of a witness without identifying with them. To be able to observe all the content of the mind, it will be necessary to strengthen the attention of isolated thought observation and then proceed to the simultaneous observation of an increasing number of thoughts, unifying them as what they are. Different contents of the same unity of which the observer is the detached witness. To achieve this, the meditator will voluntarily activate several simultaneous thoughts, observing them all at the same time in the same way they proceeded to observe bodily unity after attending to each of its parts. The unification of thoughts can be done gradually, one by one, and later, attending to several simultaneously until acquiring the unified mastery of observer of all. The same thought observation procedure will be applied to any other content of the mind, especially for internal images that arise from it. The technique of image activation will be explained below. Observation of Images 
Observing internal images can be done before, after, or simultaneously with thoughts, memories, or any other content of the mind. The best way to see an internal image is to locate a point or illuminated area within the dark panorama that appears when closing the eyes. When one of these points is located, the meditator must focus all their attention on it, expecting its structure to begin to unfold before the mind's eye until appearing as an internal image. Continuously, the brain is active. Billions of neuronal processes occur at every moment. The possibility for these processes to manifest as images, thoughts, or in any other form depends on factors such as personal history, genetic structure, and training. For the meditator interested in the reality of the observer and not an identification with its contents, the specific quality of these contents is secondary. Training in observing internal images allows them to be contemplated as contained in the unity of the observer and not as elements of identification. When attention is maintained on some bright point of the internal visual field, the attended point will transform into an internal image, which can be observed perceiving its emergence, maintenance, evolution, and disappearance as if it were a thought. For those for whom internal images arise spontaneously, the observation process is similar to that of provoked observation from a bright point. In both cases, they will be attended to by observing their emergence, development, and disappearance, remembering that they are contents of the mind and without identifying with them. Observation can continue until the meditator manages to observe several simultaneous or sequential images without losing their posture as observer of them. Simultaneous observation of images, memories, and thoughts. Finally, we will proceed to carry out a free and simultaneous observation of any content of the mind regardless of its quality and characteristics, maintaining oneself as a witness of them until achieving an observation of the unity of thought and image and of any other content of the mind. 9. Observation of Emotions we only need two more steps to describe the technique of self-elusive meditation, which are the observation of the emotional components of our psyche, whether we call them feelings or simply emotions, and the observation of patterns. The latter will be addressed in the next chapter. Observing emotions is difficult because we almost always identify with our emotional states, making detached observation a challenge. It's akin to what happens with our social role. Identifying with it is relatively easy, especially because society constantly imposes that identification. But just as the social role is a game and never our real identity, our emotions, like our thoughts, can be observed from an impartial, detached platform not identified with their observation contents. From this platform, emotions and thoughts pass by, as if happening on their own. Alan Watts describes it well when he says, It feels as if everything were me, or as if everything, including my own thoughts and actions, were happening by itself. A practical way to observe emotions is to contemplate their bodily effects one by one. In other words, to perform bodily vipassana during emotional activation. This dissected observation empowers us to make an impartial and detached observation of the emotion itself. It is advisable to dissect the bodily effects and observe the unified emotions simultaneously. To do this, it is suggested to capture the moment when an emotion begins, immediately observing the bodily changes that accompany it. These changes may consist of alterations in heart rate, modifications in breathing depth and frequency, movements and sensations in the stomach and intestines, changes in muscle tension, and so on. It is advisable to perform a bodily journey observing all the changes accompanying the emotion. This observation should be done without judgments or criticisms, but rather in a neutral, impartial state. After this, and in successive steps, it is advisable to unite the sensations until achieving a unified observation of all bodily alterations during the emotion. 
Once this is done, one can attempt a direct observation of the emotion itself as a feeling without dissections or partial observations. Finally, it is advisable to attempt a simultaneous observation of the emotion itself and of the bodily components accompanying it. As one exercises direct emotional observation and contemplation of its bodily components, mastery in this exercise will be acquired, resulting in emotional fluidity without repression and impartial observation without identifications. At the same time, this technique brings about emotional cleansing and the ability to remain unified without losing center during emotional processes. It is convenient to learn to identify different emotions and discover their dynamics, causes, and triggering stimuli. Understanding our emotional being, its processes, and conditionings leads to a healthier and more fluid life. Sustained observation of emotional changes and the discovery of their dynamics help us take ownership of ourselves at a much deeper and more total level than usual. Gradually, as emotional observation is practiced more, it leads to achieving a state of greater power and equanimity, in which emotions enrich personal life without causing confusion, intense tearing, or suffering, but rather accompanying experiences, shading them with meaning and life. It's not about making emotions disappear, but rather enriching them by giving them the place they deserve and preventing them from controlling or confusing us. Although acceptance is indispensable for success in observing any experience, for the contemplation of emotions, it is a sine qua non requirement. Emotional states must be accepted in order to be observed as they really are. Emotional repression or fear of facing any emotional state will cause any attempt at self-elusive meditation to fail. On the other hand, learning to accept emotional states will guarantee the success of meditation because every algorithmic attempt requires truthful information, which is obtained only by accepting it. 10. Observation of Patterns once all of the above has been achieved, only one more step is needed to start the practice of self-elusive meditation. Since this technique involves the ability to algorithmize, practicing self-illusion is strengthened if algorithmic exercises are performed beforehand. These exercises will be described in this chapter and consist of pattern observation. Nature offers a multitude of forms sustained by patterns, from the leaf of a tree with the arrangement of its lines to the regular waves of sand dunes and the whitish patterns of clouds. Pattern observation consists of attentively observing any object, trying to discover among its forms some regular arrangement that constitutes a pattern. The exercise could begin by closely observing a flower or a tree leaf. The longer the sustained observation time and the more patterns that are discovered, the better. Vegetal forms can be observed with the naked eye or with the help of magnifying glasses or microscopes, depending on the facilities available and personal interest. Every time a pattern is identified, an algorithm is activated. Algorithmic development occurs when patterns that increase in complexity are identified. Therefore, once the pattern of a leaf or the regular arrangement of the parts of a flower has been carefully observed, it is recommended to proceed with more complex arrangements, such as the shapes of clouds, lake or sea surfaces, rock formations, etc. Observing flames and their shapes represents an excellent practice, especially when patterns are perceived from their movements and complex morphologies. Observing dynamic and changing patterns strengthens the natural algorithmic decoding capacity of the living system interacting with the environment. One of the observation practices most used by shamans is the contemplation of the starry sky. Recognizing stellar patterns is widely recommended as preparation for self-elusive meditation. 11. Self-reflexive meditation Having completed all of the above, we are prepared for the practice of self-elusive meditation. It is suggested that the meditator sit comfortably in the place chosen for all previous practices or in any other quiet, ventilated place free of insects. 
With eyes closed and the back straight, self-elusive meditation begins by strengthening attention, focusing on the inhalation and exhalation of air into the lungs during breathing. This should be rhythmic, steady, and calm. This practice of anapana continues until attention is firmly fixed on the respiratory movements and the sensations caused by the air passing through the nostrils and entering the body, then exiting it, attending to all the details of the process. Once attention has been strengthened and there have been no distractions from a single respiratory movement for a few minutes, attention is directed toward the vertex or the top of the head to feel the bodily sensations present at that point and begin to move through the body in the practice of vipassana. Both during anapana and vipassana, any thoughts that may arise during the practice are neither repressed nor diverted. They are simply allowed to occur freely, observed with serenity, equanimity, and without identification. The bodily vipassana journey continues until there are no blind spots in any body area. When this point is reached, and the entire body can be traversed without blocks, the breath is then linked to the journey as follows, when inhaling, the body is traversed from the feet to the head, and when exhaling, the body is traversed in the opposite direction. This upward and downward journey in a respiratory rhythm continues until the entire body is felt as one unit. At that moment, the dynamic journey is interrupted, and the entire body is observed as one unit. An intermediate practice that helps achieve this observation of bodily unity is to gradually unify each part of the body during the initial journey. When the body is observed as a unit, simultaneous observation of the breath is added until the body and the breath form a new unit of observation. Once this is achieved, attention is directed to observing the contents of the mind. For this, the observation of the body and the breath is momentarily interrupted, and attention is directed to the mind, observing its contents. Thoughts are observed with equanimity without identifying with them until one can contemplate how they originate, develop, and fade away. This practice continues until all observable mental contents and their origin in the luminous mirror of the mind are perceived. When this is achieved, the observation of the mind is then combined with the unified body and breath observation, creating a new unit of body, mind, and breath. After this, attention is focused on emotions, momentarily abandoning the observation of the unity of body, mind, and breath. Emotions are observed first as they are, without dissecting their visceral and vegetative components, and then by paying attention to the bodily changes that accompany them. Any spontaneously arising emotion is observed with equanimity, without judging, analyzing, or qualifying it. Just as any thought is allowed to flow without repression or diversion, emotions are allowed to flow until they can be observed along with all their bodily changes without identification with them. Once this is achieved, emotions, their bodily changes, the mind and its thoughts, the body, and the breath are all observed simultaneously, incorporating them all into a new unit. This observation of the unity of all components of experience that can be contemplated is called observation of the totality of oneself in the present. Obviously, this observation of totality is not of the entirety of the universe, but only of what is possible to observe in the present. Observation of the totality of oneself in the present is self-elusive meditation in its components. The next step in the technique is to observe the result of the union of all elements of oneself in the sensation of selfhood or the self. Similar to the observation of emotions as they are and the dissected observation of the bodily, visceral, and vegetative components accompanying them, self-elusive contemplation consists of the dissected observation of all components of experience that can be observed and the observation of the unified result. It is recommended for the meditator to achieve mastery in the observation of the components before attempting the observation of the unified self. When the observation of the unified self can be performed directly, it is advisable to occasionally make a careful review of the components of experience by observing them in order to correct and enrich the inclusion algorithms resulting from unification. 
Self-elusive meditation can be strengthened by practicing it during daily life without the need for special schedules or secluded places, incorporating not only the components I have indicated but also sensory elements and visual and auditory precepts. Self-elusive meditation that incorporates the visual and auditory world into the observation of unity brings the meditator closer to the observation of reality, which is the true objective and goal of self-elusive meditation. In contemporary physics, the algorithm that describes a very complex dynamic system is called a strange attractor. If we suppose that there are strange attractors in the brain, these could be considered as guides of the system during the self-elusive process. Imagine a moment when a person forgets someone's name momentarily, and when trying to remember it, there is a feeling that the forgotten name is on the tip of the tongue. Somehow, for the consciousness seeking the name, the sensation and the search seem to be guided precisely by a strange attractor. The search ends, and the system reaches its equilibrium when the strange attractor becomes the algorithm for the remembered name. Something similar happens in self-elusive meditation, in which there must be assumed to be a guide or strange attractor that literally attracts the system toward algorithmic decoding, but not of a name, but rather of the total and real state of the subject in a given present. If this attractive guide did not exist, self-illusion would not be possible. It's as if the system contains its future developmental state and attracts itself toward it. Since the state activated by self-elusive meditation is that of contact with reality, and reality exists always, the strange attractor guiding self-illusion is this omnipresent, all-encompassing, and all-knowing reality. This reality is that of the observer. In esoteric Christianity, the observer is represented as an eye inside a triangle. The triangle represents the Christian trinity, and the observer eye is what unifies the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The secret of the Christian trinity and what unifies it is the observer. Many lineages of Mexican shamans have incorporated this symbol and venerate it deeply. In Hinduism, there is also a trinity, that of Krishna, Vishnu, and Shiva, the creator, the sustainer, and the destroyer. This trinity is contained in the self, Purusha, Atman, which is untouched and remains unmoved regardless of the changes the universe undergoes, occupying a place similar to that of the observer. In India, it is said that the self is not burned by fire, not wetted by water, nor can any weapon hurt it. The goal of self-elusive meditation is precisely the encounter with the reality of the observer and the self, through the algorithmic activation of increased inclusive power. As we have seen, this technique consists of observing the totality of oneself in the present. This totality is the unity of all processes that coexist at a given moment. With constant practice, this observation of the totality of oneself is achieved effortlessly. Self-illusion is the observation of the characteristic state from a perspective free of identifications. It is seeing oneself from a transcendent and simultaneously neutral stance. In this self-observation, the subject approaches oneself free of contents because the observation is not intellectual or even logical, but rather direct and total. As we have already seen, to achieve unification, one proceeds gradually by uniting various aspects. First of all, bodily sensations, then thoughts and emotions. In other words, first, one proceeds with the technique of anapana and vipassana until the bodily image is unified. Then one proceeds to do the same with thoughts and ideas until all the emotional components of the present are incorporated into the same unity. The unification of all experiences into one produces the sensation of identity of the totality of oneself in the present. This egoic sensation is the content of self-illusion in which the ego of the present proceeds to be observed. With practice, the gradual unification of all spheres of experiences becomes unnecessary because the meditator becomes capable of identifying their sameness and observing it directly. 12. 
permanent and unlimited self-referential meditation. When achieving self-reference without intermediate sequences, the next step in practice is to maintain self-referential observation permanently. To do this, it is necessary to strengthen focused attention that prevents distraction and maintains observation during daily life. Self-referential meditation should not be confused with analytical contemplation or activation of critical thinking and judgments. The permanent self-referential meditator always remembers who he is and remains alert, avoiding identifying with the contents of his experience. He simply observes himself self-referring. When self-referral is achieved, the experience of selfhood transforms. In contemporary physics, it is known that the observer participates in and modifies his objects of observation. Similarly, the subject who observes the totality of himself in the present transforms this totality since he incorporates into it the new element of his self-reference. The new totality of the self thus obtained can be observed again by self-referring. This new self-reference modifies the totality again, and so on. When self-referential meditation continues in this dynamic process of sustained self-reference, it is called limitless. Permanent self-referential meditation without limits can continue until the moment when the system fails to unify into a new sensation of algorithmizable selfhood and therefore susceptible to being observed and self-referred. The algorithmization of the totality of the present is the sensation of yoic selfhood. Two or three self-references of transformed yoikness can lead the system to an informational density of such a high caliber that the decantation of its algorithm requires a relatively long time to be achieved. If observation is maintained during this algorithmic search, sooner or later the subject will be able to unify into a sensation of yoikness susceptible to being observed. There comes a moment when permanent self-referential meditation without limits leads the subject to place himself in his own identity in unity with the rest. In conclusion, permanent and limitless self-referential meditation is the capacity to observe the totality of oneself at every moment without identifications with any of its contents, maintaining and remembering reality. 13. Final Considerations there is no limit to observation. Even in moments when self-referral is not possible, this incapacity can be observed. It is possible to observe one's own confusion and contemplate one's own forgetfulness. Even in moments of maximum emptiness or deep depression, the observer remains. The ability to remember that one can always observe is the ability to maintain a state of optimism, faith, and hope in life in its sense. No matter how terrible mental suffering may be, no matter how deep the confusion, dislike, or sorrow may be, the observer remains pure, untouched, and totally self-sufficient in his capacity. The existence of the observer is the foundation of true faith. The last consideration that I dare to suggest before finishing this book is the recommendation to remember that one can observe. Strengthening this memory and its application at all times will ensure that any human being becomes increasingly master of himself, optimistic, and aware that there is always a next step. Appendix The Observer and the Lattice One of the most interesting aspects of the conception of the lattice is its great similarity to the properties of the observer. Both the observer and the lattice are a singularity, moreover, both are constructs independent from which diverse manifestations are generated in an infinite number. Regardless of the appearance of any elemental particle and all chemical compounds and objects in the universe, the lattice is preserved as a unique and singular sustenance. Similarly, the observer is unique and singular regardless of the contents of his experience. According to these analogies, one could think that what we call lattice is the observer himself. This would be in agreement with the experience of identity of the observer with the subject of experience when the brain of the latter and its neuronal field reach a high coherence. 
In a state of high coherence, the neuronal field mimics the fundamental state of the lattice, so the identity between lattice and observer is also based from a physiological, physical, and phenomenological point of view. According to these considerations, the fundamental state is the active silence of the observer and never the absence of consciousness in a hypothetical passive nothingness. The state of silence so longed for by seekers of the essential state of being is not then the absence of consciousness of an absolute mental void but the self-sufficient and vital consciousness of the pure self and of reality. Finally, despite all the aforementioned analogies, there is evidence suggesting that the observer cannot be reduced to the lattice, nor is the lattice itself the observer. This evidence is contained in the behavior of the greatest shaman of Mexico, Pachita. Pachita was capable of materializing objects and making them disappear, demonstrating almost total control over the lattice. If the observer were the lattice itself, this control would be impossible. Somehow, Pachita managed to distort the lattice until it acquired the same conformation and structure as an object, and it appeared. Presumably, this behavior was the result of the characteristics of Pachita's neuronal field in interaction with the lattice and her voluntary management. This management is irreducible to the lattice. Therefore, the observer is not the lattice, but transcends it. The observer as reality cannot be reduced to any physical model or to any explanation or thought, no matter how inclusive it may be. The observer transcends the lattice and the mind and belongs to the self. Crezio, Baja California, June 13, 1987 Glossary Algorithmization refers to the process of obtaining algorithms from raw information. It is a mechanism for data concentration and increasing informational density. Algorithm An algorithm is a pattern, a structure, a mathematical formula, or any other process capable of containing large amounts of information in a reduced and concentrated form. A good example of an algorithm is the structure of DNA, capable of containing all the information about a body. The decoding of an algorithm produces the retrieval of the information concentrated in its structure. In the case of DNA, its decoding results in a body. Strange attractor, in physics, it refers to the algorithm that describes a complex system and towards which the system thrives. Self-reference, it is the observation of a totality from a perspective of non-identification with its contents. It is equivalent to the observation of an algorithm from outside of it. Quantum field, refers to the lattice of space-time. Neuronal field, it is the global activity of a living brain resulting from the interactions of all the neuronal elements that compose it. The neuronal field is a hyper-complex three-dimensional alteration of the lattice of space-time. There are around 12 billion neurons in the human brain. The number of possible interactions between all the neurons is equal to the total number of particles in the universe. When each neuron is activated, it creates a micro-distortion of the lattice of space-time. The total set of these micro-distortions of the lattice of space-time is called the neuronal field. Convergence circuits refer to a type of connections between neurons in which many elements send information to a smaller number, forming circuits that include large amounts of information in few elements. Through these convergence circuits, information can be algorithmized. Conditionings, learned behaviors as a result of the association of a stimulus with a response of several stimuli or several responses. Decoding, refers to the logical reconstruction of the information included and concentrated in algorithms. Double, refers to the energetic body of a shaman located in the hypercampus. Duration of the present, it is the minimum time necessary to create a conscious experience. Each perceptual modality has its own duration. 
For example, the duration of the present within a visual image is around 50 milliseconds, which is the minimum time necessary to create a visual percept. Ego refers to the personality self distinct from the pure self or the self because it is dependent on an individual personal history. Space-time, according to Einstein's theory of relativity, space and time form an inseparable unity. In the basic structure of the lattice, time does not elapse, and there are no objects or elementary particles, a change in the organization of the lattice appears as an object and a temporal change. If the lattice were to disappear, space, time, and matter would not exist. The disappearance of all objects and time would end the lattice. Hardware, technical term referring to the physical structure of electronic circuits of a computer. Hypercampus, set of interactions between all neuronal fields in the lattice of space-time. The hypercampus is the formation of greatest complexity of the lattice of space-time. Identification, it is believing and feeling that the contents of experience are the same. External images, refers to the contents of visual perception of the environment. The set of objects, colors, textures, landscapes, etc. form the external images. Internal images, refers to the contents of visual perception of the inner world. Inclusion by convergence, the activity of convergence circuits results in the creation of inclusive algorithms, that is, neuronal patterns that concentrate previously dispersed information. A neuronal algorithm is an informational inclusion in which patterns of activity of many neurons are concentrated in few ones. Lattice, according to quantum mechanics, space-time has a basic structure of total coherence and symmetry called the lattice. The lattice also forms the foundation of matter, since any alteration of its basic and fundamental structure gives rise to an elementary particle. Any chemical compound and any energetic field are specific alterations of the lattice. The concept of lattice emerged from X-ray crystallography studies in which the structure of crystals appeared as a network or matrix. The lattice of space-time could be conceptualized as a network or hypercomplex matrix permeating everything. Meditation results from the ability to maintain focused attention on some content of experience inside, on the surface, or outside the body. Self-referential meditation, it is the sustained observation of the totality of oneself in the present. Dendritic micropotentials, they are oscillations of the membrane potential of neuronal dendrites. Dendrites are outgrowths of the neuronal body responsible for receiving information from other neurons. According to some neurophysiologists, see Carl Prebram, the set of dendritic micropotentials of a neuronal population form hypercomplex wave fronts that are transmitted throughout the brain. Each dendritic micropotential is an alteration of the lattice of space-time. Each wave front is also the set of dendritic micropotentials and all wave fronts are part of the neuronal field. Relative world, the world of concrete objects, temporary emotions, and restricted identifications. Levels of algorithmization. Each time an algorithm is obtained from certain information, an algorithmization level is activated. The process can continue, but now using the algorithms from the previous level as data for the next one. Levels of inclusion refers to the levels of algorithmization. Information is included at each level and can be observed from the next one. The process is parallel to self-referential observation in which the information included in one level is observed from the level that refers to it. Observer refers to the self or the pure self identified with itself. The witness of the mind. Observer, it is the subject of experience identified with the contents of the mind. It is a witness associated with the ego. Visual percept, it is a perceptual image formed by details, objects, shapes, 
and textures resulting from the interaction between the neuronal field and the lattice of space-time. Reality, it is the pure self. Reality refers to objects, bodies, and energetic transformations resulting from alterations of the basic and fundamental structure of the lattice of space-time. Social role, the role imposed on us by society within it. Self, the pure self. It is the identity with the whole in the absence of the ego. The self transcends the ego. Synergy, it is a measure of coherence, informational density, and redundancy of information. The higher the value of the previous variables, the greater the synergy. The informational structure with the highest synergy is that of the lattice of space-time in its basic state. Software, technical term referring to the programs of a computer. Subtext, refers colloquially to what physics calls a strange attractor. It is what is between the lines, the hidden message behind words and verbal or behavioral arguments. Subject of experience, it is the subject identified with his experience. It is the one who feels immersed in his feelings. Superego, in Freudian theory, it refers to the interject moral mechanism. It is the structured part of the mind that judges and establishes the ideals of the self. When these are not achieved, the superego exerts its action by punishing the system. Synergetic theory, according to this theory, experience arises as a result of the interaction between the neuronal field and the lattice of space-time. The end.